Hello everyone, let's go with the dissection of the midgut and hindgut by going through the peritoneum for this region. First, as always, we want to orient ourselves. This is the right hand side of the abdominal cavity. Here is the left hand side. Here is the top and here is the bottom part. Here is the greater momentum attached to the greater curvature of the stomach. By pulling the greater momentum superiorly, we are in the midgut and hindgut region. Okay, first, let's begin with the duodeno-jejunal duodeno junction. Okay, here is the duodeno-jejunal junction. And then I'm gonna actually walk you through the intestinal loops. First, we have the duodenum, and then we have the ileum. Now I'm holding the loops of the duodenum and ileum in my hand. And as you see, they are attached to the posterior abdominal wall by the double layer fold of the peritoneum known as mesentery. And that's the mesentery which carries the blood vessels and nerve fibers and lymphatics to and out of the intestinal loops. At the end of the small intestinal loops, we have the ileocecal junction. Right here is the ileocecal junction. And below to this area, we have the cecum right here. And then appendix attached to the ileocecal junction right here. And then on the right hand side, we have the ascending colon right here. And the, on the end of the ascending colon, we have the right colic flexure right there. And then transverse colon, starting from the right hand side, going all the way to the left hand side. Sorry, right here again, from the right hand side all the way to the left. And then on the left, we have the left colic flexure right here. Descending colon, then sigmoid colon, and of course rectum is inside the pelvis that is not being dissected yet. As you see, the large intestine forms a frame, like a picture frame, all the way around the small intestine. We are going to examine the differences between the duodenum and ileum. Let's begin by finding the duodenal jejunal junction, or just finding the duodenum, okay? And then we just walk through the duodenum and we reach to the ileum. It's worth mentioning that there is not distinct border between the duodenum and ileum. So we just come to the cecum and then we find the ileocecal junction. From here, you can find the ileum. Now I go backward and then I try to find a part of the ileum. We have opened the part of the ileum here. We also have opened a part of the duodenum. Now let's zoom in to these two areas to have a close lookup of the differences between the duodenum and ileum. Here is the wall of the duodenum and here is the wall of ileum. As you can see, there are a lot of mucosal folds inside the duodenum, whereas we do not have mucosal folds in the ileum. The wall of the ileum is thinner than the wall of the duodenum. And also worth mentioning that we do have the aggregation of the lymphatic follicles on the, under the mucous membrane of the ileum known as Peyer's patches. But unfortunately, we do not have an example of Peyer's patches here that we can show you. The lumen of the duodenum is wider than the lumen of ileum. And these are actually the main characteristics of the duodenum and ileum. We are examining the ileocecal junction and ileocecal valve. Let's begin by going through the loops of the duodenum here, and then we reach to the ileum, and here is the cecum, right, this area. Then that is ileocecal junction, and as you can see, appendix is hanging from the ileocecal junction. And of course, this area, this part, is the ascending colon. Now we are opening the anterior wall of the cecum and we are examining the ileocecal valve. So here is the anterior wall of the cecum is being opened. Of course, we have already opened that. We have cleaned the content and then we go through the ileocecal valve. So let's zoom in on this area right here. 
Here is the close-up of the ileocecal valve. And as you see, the valve is made by two lips. But keep in your mind that in life, the valve is round. And that is because of the muscular tonicity of the valve. We are examining the characteristics of the large intestine. As you recall, large intestine is wider than small intestine, but it's shorter than a small intestine. So then one characteristic is the width of the large intestine. There are also three other characteristics of the large intestine we, go, we want to go through, which are teniaculi, hostraculi, and epiploic appendices. Now let's zoom in on this section of the large intestine to go through those three characteristics. As you recall, the longitudinal muscular layer of the large intestine is gathered in three places, forming the structure known as teniaculi. Here is the teniaculi, one of the teniaculi. And since the teniaculi are shorter than the actual length of the large intestine, they make some pouches along the, the wall of the large intestine known as hostraculi. Here is one hostraculi, and the other hostraculi is here, right there. So then hostraculi is made by the presence of the teniaculi. The last characteristic is the small bags of fat hanging from the, the wall of the large intestine known as epiploic appendices or omental appendices. It is worth mentioning that not all these characteristics can be found along the wall of entire length of the large intestine. For example, there is no teniaculi or epiploic appendices along the wall of the rectum. Now we want to dissect the branches of the superior mesenteric artery which are in charge of the blood supply of the duodenum, ileum, and a part of the large intestine. As you recall, those branches running between two layers of mesentery, which is right here. So now, the way that we do the dissection of the branches is to, we cut one layer of the um, mesentery. As you see, mesentery has two layers. Okay, so now I'm removing one layer of the mesentery, right here. Okay. And I'm gonna grab my scissor to go with this layer. That's one layer of mesentery. And also here. Okay. And then just move my scissor along the branches of the artery. And these are the leaf nodes between two layers of the mesentery. And if you recall, we have the vasorecta, these branches at the end, going to the loops of the small intestine. Okay, one of the best way to see the branches of the, the vasorecta and the arcuate arteries of the duodenal and ileal branches is to put the flashlight behind the, the mesentery. So I'm gonna turn off the lights and then grab my flashlight right here and hopefully if we zoom here, right there, and then it's showing the, the vasorecta. terminal branches of duodenal and ileal arteries. We are going through the dissection of the superior mesenteric artery and its 
and its branches, which are in charge of the blood supply of the mid-gut organs. We have removed a layer of the mesentery from this area to expose the branches of the superior mesentery artery. Here is the trunk of the superior mesentery artery, right here, which is arising from the abdominal aorta at the level of L1. It gives off the jejunal and ileal branches on the left-hand side, which are in charge of the blood supply of the jejunum and ileum loops. It also gives off this big branch known as ileocolic, which coming towards the cecum and appendix. The last two branches that we want to look at are middle colic, this one, going towards the transverse colon by passing through the two layers of transverse mesocolon, and right colic, which comes towards the right colic flexure and ascending colon. As you notice in this cadaver, these two branches, middle colic and the right colic, coming off a common stem. However, usually they are arising from superior mesenteric artery separately. Now let's follow the one of the jejunal branches which are going towards the loop of the loops of the GI genome and making the arcuate artery. Let's focus on this area right here to have better view of arcuate artery. This is one of the arcuate artery, which giving off the, the vasorecta branches. These are vasorecta branches going towards the, the loop of geogenum. We want to dissect the inferior mesenteric artery and its branches, which are in charge of the blood supply of the hindgut derivatives. We have moved the loops of the duogenum and ileum to the right-hand side. You can see the transverse colon, and the posterior abdominal wall has been partially exposed. Here is the abdominal aorta, right here. And this is inferior mesenteric artery, coming off the abdominal aorta at the level of L3. Following that down, we can find the left colic branch right here, going towards the descending colon. Around three branches going to the sigmoid colon, known as sigmoidal branches. One, two, three. And then superior rectal artery, which going down to supply the rectum. We are going through the formation of the hepatic portal vein. As you recall, hepatic portal vein is formed by the joining of the superior mesenteric vein and splenic vein. However, the inferior mesenteric vein, which is this one, first drain into the splenic vein, right there. The superior mesenteric vein drains into the splenic vein. And then I'm gonna pull the loops of the duogenum and ileum to the right-hand side. You're finding the superior mesenteric vein, which is this one. So one more time, splenic vein, this one, joins to superior mesenteric vein, and together they form the hepatic portal vein. This is hepatic portal vein. Now I'm gonna hold on the hepatic portal vein right here, pull the transverse colon down, Okay, here is the stomach. I'm gonna pull that one down as well, right here. And the pancreas, here is the neck of pancreas right there. I'm gonna pull that down. Now you can see that I'm holding the hepatic portal vein. And as you recall, the hepatic portal vein is a part of the portal triad. It goes to the liver through the portal hepatis and drains its blood into the liver, and then eventually the venous blood of the liver will be drained into the inferior vena cava through the hepatic vein. 